pleasure to welcome Hiroshi Uguri of, oop, of Caltech, sorry about that, Hiroshi Uguri of Caltech and the Kavli Institute of, of the Universe in Japan. <laughs> and um, he has requested a couple of things. One is if you have questions, don't wait, just go ahead and interrupt. And the other is he'd love to see everybody. So please do not turn off your video. Stay on so that he feels like he's talking to people. Anyway. <laughs> I, I might want to make sure my joke works, so yeah. <laughs> That's right, you, you, you need verification. Anyway, <laughs> he's, he's going to tell us today about symmetry in quantum field theory. Okay, may I start? Gravity, please, okay. please do it. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak. And also, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for running this show, uh, enable us to, to meet each other during this difficult time. I was just seeing who are logging in, and uh, I'm wonderful to see so many friends that I haven't seen for a while. So thank you very much for that. So the title of my talk today is rather generic, Symmetry in Quantum Field Theory and Gravity, but it's based on the uh, uh, three works that I did with Daniel Haro. Uh, first, I uh, reviewed the work that I did a few years ago, and I have given talk on this a few times, but uh, uh, I think some of these more mathematical audience might not have seen it. So, so I thought that it'd be good to talk about it. And then second half of my talk, I will focus on some more recent work and also some work in progress if I have time. Uh, that's something I'm doing with my student and postdoc. So this is Daniel, I, I, you, you, I see the Dan is here and Shidon. Dan, this is not Aspen, this is somewhere else. And so probably you remember who it is. Okay, so, so I'd like to talk about the uh, symmetry and quantum gravity. And basically I'm interested in constraint on symmetry uh, for consistent quantum theory of gravity. So there is a standard rule that uh, quantum gravity does not have exact global symmetry. And uh, there have been a uh, lot of argument for this. Uh, I learned this from uh, the paper by uh, Tom Banks and Nati Dyberg. And uh, but, uh, I, I don't know who to, uh, whom to precisely. Uh, I think the, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, uh, work on this subject. Uh, but uh, so the so standard argument goes as follows that suppose there is a global symmetry uh, in quantum gravity. So this is to contrast with gauge symmetry where uh, uh, there is actually uh, no uh, local conserved charge. So here, I assume that there is a global symmetry. I'm go going to give you a more precise definition of what I mean by global symmetry. But suppose you have a global symmetry in qu quantum gravity. Then that means that there must be a charged state. So you can combine these charged state to be able to make a, a black hole with large representation of group G. I'm assuming that G is a compact Lie group, so you can have arbitrary large representation. Uh, large means that the dimension being large. <clears throat> so suppose you have such black hole and put it in flat space and it's Hawking radiate. And if you start with a large black hole, then uh, you, it takes a while for it to become small, but uh, uh, you can arrange so that uh, the dimension representation is large enough so that at some point, you get into some kind of a contradiction where the dimension of the representation of the group G become larger than the number of black hole states that you can you expect to have by bekenstein hawking entropy formula. So, so this would be a contradiction and the contradiction comes from the assumption that you have global symmetry. This won't happen for gauge symmetry. For example, if you have Maxwell theory, then if you have a charged black hole, then there is a, a gauge field that communicate. So, so, so that, that gives you the repulsion force between the like charges. So that means that there is an imbalance in the, uh, the way that charge is emitted from the black hole. So, so this won't happen in gauge symmetry, but if you have global symmetry, and then if we assume that Hawking radiation is in, uh, blind for under the, uh, the symmetry group G, then, then this contradiction would happen. Okay. So this is sort of argument, as I said, I learned this from the paper by Tom and Nati, but uh, uh, there are some questions that you can ask to this argument. And also uh, this does not work for finite group because if you have finite group, then the number of representations is finite. 
And uh, 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 therefore, you, you cannot do this argument for, for parametric energy representation. So we would like to have a better argument. So that was sort of one of the motivation for, for this work that I did with Daniel earlier to discuss this, to, to show this in a more precise way in the context of ADS CFT correspondence. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to discuss about uh, symmetry in quantum field theory without, uh, without gravity. And uh, because we would like to define what we mean by symmetry in the CFT side too. So suppose you have a quantum field theory uh, with some global symmetry G, what does it mean? So, so I'm going to use the Hamiltonian picture. So you assume that there, I assume that there is a space-like Cauchy surface and time. And suppose you have a group G. So there are a few things that uh, we would like this statement to imply. And one is that uh, there is a unitary homomorphism from group G to the set of unitary operator on the Hilbert space of this quantum field theory. Okay. So we call this as a homomorphism. This is weaker than saying that there is a representation on the Hilbert space. We could have said it, but uh, uh, in a situation where group G is spontaneously broken, uh, it would be useful to weaken it. Uh, in, in this talk today, I will not discuss much about spontaneously broken situation. So you can assume that uh, uh, you, can, you can think that uh, this is actually represented uh, in, in this Hilbert space. And then it suppose acts on the algebra of local operators uh, for any sub subspace of uh, the Cauchy slice. So you choose some subspace and there is a set of local operators on this subspace. And then this unitary operator is supposed to act uh, on this space. And it should be faithful on this, on this algebra that uh, the otherwise, uh, you, you, if you have an, uh, op, uh, a symmetry that does not uh, that commute with all the local operators, that does not seem to be an interesting uh, 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 symmetry. And by calling it symmetry, I assume that it commutes with energy momentum tensor. So, so if you're in the modern language, you may say that these are topological uh, operator. Okay. So these are the assumptions. I think I hope this is not controversial. And. But I also, we are also assume one more thing, which is called splitability. And this may be something that uh, may not be familiar to all of you. So I'd like to discuss it a little bit. So this is a property of uh, this global symmetry that follows from some assumption on quantum field theory that I would like to clarify. So first I would like to tell you that this is, this is actually a very reasonable property to assume that suppose uh, group G is a continuous, say, V group. And in that case, Neta theorem says that there has to be a Neta current J. And uh, uh, then the, this unitary operator that I mentioned can be expressed as the exponential of integral of this Neta, Neta, Neta current. Okay, so, so you can write it in this way. So then it, it follows from this expression that if you split the space like slice into Say, uh, uh, union of uh, disjoint subspaces, then you can write this operator as a product of operator acting on each of these subspaces. It just follows from the fact that it's an integral, exponential of integral of this operator. So if this sigma is decomposed into subspaces, the exponent becomes sum. So therefore, this operator becomes product, okay? So, so this, is, this, is, this is a consequence of the Neta theorem for continuous symmetry. But this is a property of the symmetry, so, you, so there is a name for it, and this is called splitability. So there is actually a theorem in algebraic quantum field theory, I learned this from Ed Witten, uh, that uh, if you assume property of quantum field theory called the split, split property, split property, then this splitability for, of symmetry follows. And it follows even for discrete symmetry. So this is an interesting part. That is that uh, here I was able to show this for continuous symmetry, but it turns out that if you quantum field theory satisfies the split property, then this is also true for finite group symmetry. Okay, so this, so this is an uh, uh, interesting uh, 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 property. And since this is an important for the rest of my talk, so I'd like to elaborate a little bit on this assumption, split property. A split property is defined in this way. 
So we say that, suppose you have a quantum field theory, we say that it has split property if the following is true. So suppose you have uh, two open subset of this Cauchy slice, so that uh, essentially S is inside of S prime, but with some margin on the boundary. So to be precise, the closure of S is inside of the interior of S prime. So then we say that quantum field theory has split property if the, uh, between the algebra of local operator in S and S prime, in between them, there is a type one factor. Okay, so that is, a, that is called the split property. So, so let me expand on this. So type one factor, so let me first explain what type one factor means. So suppose, so, so when you have von Neumann algebra, we say that uh, this uh, 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 von Neumann algebra is factor if its center is trivial. That is that uh, uh, if center contains only of this operator of this type. And type one means that uh, it has minimum projection. So that's what called type one factor. And type one algebra is a very nice algebra. For example, if it is acting on the Hilbert space, then if you have a type one factor, then you can always split Hilbert space into two parts. One, which is realizing this algebra and the other which commute with this, uh, whose who algebra, uh, whose algebra over this Hilbert space commute with. So, 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 so that's sort of a, a nice property of type one factor. But the reason that we, we, we do this is that uh, the algebra of local operator A of S is famously not type one factor. So for example, this is uh, something that is discussed in one of recent uh, Ed Witten's paper. Uh, and, uh, but the split property means that even though A of S is not type one, but if you thicken it a little bit, then you can, you can include that inside of type one factor. So that's what the split property means. And if you have type one factor Hilbert space split, so that I think is a, a motivation for this name. Okay. And uh, uh, I think that, so for example, Daniel probably is familiar with this kind of subject. And, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, for Euclidean space, uh, this is supposed to be true. That this known example, all known example, is supposed to be true. Hi, Nati. Imagine your space is a lattice of points. Sorry. Oh, okay. In, the, how much of this discussion is non-trivial there? Okay. So, for example, we can give. A, I'm going to give a counter example to splitability. So we can ask, what happens if you put this? space to be lattice. Yeah, Can we okay, discuss this? I'll wait. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so, so since Nati asked how non-trivial this is, so, so I give you an example where this fails. So I say that the split property is supposed to expect it to hold for Euclidean space, but does not necessarily hold for more non-trivial topology. So here is a counter example. So suppose you have this kind of torus type of situation where you have S1, and some compact space like this, D minus two. So total space is D dimensional. So time is one dimensional. So D minus two, D minus one spatial direction, you split into this way. So suppose you have a pure Maxwell theory. So then there is an electric flux going, you can define going through it, and this is conserved. And uh, this electric flux commute with the space of local operators that I define this way. Suppose I have this kind of bound-like bound -like region, S. Then this commute with this because this is this conserved, so you can split this off. So then this F does not belong to S, so obviously they commute with each other. So, so that means that this is in center of uh, this von Neumann. If this type one von Neumann algebra exists, it must be in this center. But this operator is a non trivial operator because it does not commute with the Wilson line going around the dual cycle. So this is not, this is not, this theory does not split. So now we can ask Nati, what happens if you put this theory on the lattice? Okay. And uh, uh, so this, I think is the, con so this it is closely related to the fact that this theory has one form global symmetry. So this operator is actually global symmetry. And uh, so the conservation of one form symmetry is, is related to the, so basically the generator of this one form symmetry is making this uh, center non-trivial in some sense. And uh, as soon as you introduce charges, then this, uh, this symmet one form symmetry is broken. So therefore split property is restored. 
Okay, and the related uh, if you have uh, like uh, two uh, Maxwell cell product of two U1 series, then there is a symmetry mixing them, but there is no net charge associated with it. And, uh, and uh, because, well, uh, the, if, it is a, if it is split, then uh, the uh, symmetry becomes splittable. So therefore you would expect something like net current to exist, but uh, it does not exist. And that's the reason is that this theory has no split product. Okay, Nat is still raising a hand. Oh, okay. Uh, so okay, so uh, we can we can have some discussion on this on this example later. Okay. So to recap, uh, uh, this is a definition of splitability. So we say quantum field theory is split if there is a von Neumann algebra uh, between those kind of things. The, basically, the algebra of local operator does not split. That is not type one. But you can make this almost type one like this. And this is a nice thing because if you have this silver space free. Okay, and uh, it is generally expected that the Euclidean theory, it is in uh, quantum field theory is split. But uh, if you have non trivial topologies, then there are counter examples. And uh, I, if you assume that this is true, that quantum field theory on Euclidean space split, then conformal field theory on sphere times time should also split because these are conformally related. And this will be sufficient for purpose. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about quantum field theory, uh, symmetry of quantum field theory. Any questions? So let me proceed. So I'd like to discuss now symmetry in uh, quantum gravity, global symmetry in quantum gravity. So this is a little bit tricky subject because I want to define what we mean by global symmetry in quantum gravity, but then I want to prove that such a thing does not exist. So I need to define it in such a, uh, define the object that does not exist. Well, the, in practice, what I would like to do is that to enumerate all the properties that uh, we would expect for such symmetry to have, and then data show that those are inconsistent. Okay, so that's what we want to do. And the first thing we want to say is that uh, if, you, if you have anti -data space, quantum gravity in anti -data space, and if this theory has global symmetry, then we would expect that dual conformal field theory to have symmetry too. And the reason for that is that uh, if you have any quasi local operator, the op operator that may not necessarily be sharply at the point, but something like a black hole even, which is extended in space. But if you, ha if you have any of those things which has finite energy, then there is always a local operator corresponding to it on the boundary. So therefore, if there is any sort of non-trivial global symmetry acting on this kind of object, then there ought to be uh, uh, global symmetry in conformal field theory satisfying these four properties. Now that seems to be reasonable, but we'd like to ask a few more uh, uh, property. One is that, uh, as many of you know, the notion of local operator in quantum gravity is subtle. And uh, in the case of uh, uh, ABS-CFT, uh, you have to attach some, what is called gravitational dressing uh, to this to make it diffeomorphic invariant. And we assume that this dressing procedure is neutral under symmetry. And we also assume, just like in the case of conformal field theory, that uh, symmetry acts faithfully on these local operators. And we also assume that these symmetries are distinct from conformal symmetry on the boundary. By the way, conformal symmetry on the boundary is supposed to be the non-normalizable part of uh, diffeomorphism symmetry in the bulk. So you can call that as a gauge symmetry in the bulk, not the global symmetry in the bulk. Sometimes I get questioned about that, so I wanted to preempt that here. So that's sort of a, a, what we mean by quantum gravity. And I would like to uh, show that uh, such a thing does not exist. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so, so here, so to do that, I use what is called entanglement wedge reconstruction. So, so this is uh, one of the very, very important uh, 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 insights that uh, people gained using ads -CFT correspondence in the last 10 years or so. So, uh, so the idea is that, uh, so, so in, in, if you have a gravitational theory in ADS, you can consider some local excitation in the bulk. But if, you, if this excitation goes deeper into the bulk, then information about this excitation is encoded on the, some kind of entanglement properties on the boundary. So for example, this is sort of a caricature to demonstrate this point 
that to suppose you have some kind of local excitation over here, then entanglement wedge reconstruction says that uh, this can be encoded on in the boundary region, in this case, B union C, uh, whose Ryu Takayanagi surface and uh, this union, if you consider Ryu Takayanagi surface and union, this in, uh, in between region, if this local excitation is included in this, then you can encode the information about this local excitation in B union C. So that's sort of the, basically the statement. You have you, you actually consider some time of development of this, but this is a spatial slice of this statement. Okay, but this is a, this is at first sight this looks puzzling, and uh, so this leads to the work by Daniel Haro and his collaborator, uh, in, in particular with Armet uh, Amheri and Shidon, and uh, uh, so so for example, suppose you have this excitation here. Then you can encode the information in B union C, and you can also encode the information in A union B, and you can also encode the information into C union A, because these are all in this shaded region. But if you just consider A alone, then entanglement wedge of A does not cover this point, so it's not encoded. So therefore, A alone cannot know about this, B alone cannot know about this, C alone cannot know about this. But if you combine some of these regions, you can reconstruct this. So this suggests that the uh, information about excitation in the bulk is encoded in the entanglement properties. And in fact, uh, uh, the, one of the important insights is that the way that this encoding is happening is very closely related to the way that the quantum error correcting code works. So, uh, so th that's sort of one of the very close connection between holography and the quantum information theory. So with this preparation, uh, I'm going to give you uh, a derivation, a proof of the statement that there is no global symmetry. So suppose to the contrary, that uh, there is a global symmetry in the uh, uh, gravitational theory in the ADS, then that means that there must be some kind of local bulk operator that transforms phase free under, phase free under the symmetry. So suppose you, I put this operator in the middle of ADS. And I assume that quantum field theory has split property. So therefore symmetry generator split. So, so that means that this symmetry generator can be expressed as a product of operator acting on the each of these boundary regions. But as you can see in this particular case, the entanglement wedge of each of these boundary regions does not touch this X. So therefore each one of these operator commute with this local excitation. But since each one of them commute, the product of them commute. So that means that this unitary operator, which is supposed to be generating symmetry, commute with this operator. And this contradicts with the original assumption that the uh, local excitation here is faithfully representing the symmetry. Okay, so that's a contradiction. So that's sort of one page proof of the statement, which uh, Daniel and I uh, published in five page comment uh, summary in physical review letters and later 175 pages, uh, 35 uh, uh, times uh, longer uh, in the complete exposition of this derivation. Okay, so, so that's sort of the main part of the first half of my talk. Uh, any questions so far? Oh, is it an issue um, when you say that U is the product of the little U's? Yes. Uh, slightly oversimplified, of course. Yes, if I agree. The, there are boundary issues, yes. Is there a simple way to deal with the boundary issues? Uh, so that requires some delicate <laughs> discussion on the... Uh, uh, what uh, what happens when uh, how, how what kind of uh, 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 correction that you have to make on the boundary and what kind of effect that would have over here? But if I imagine that I think that if this is some local uh, can, can boundary correction can be made with local operator here, it won't affect the commutativity with X. Okay. Intuitively, I think it's clear. I just was wondering. If there's a convenient way to no, make a really nice statement, we, we we have to we have to have a ra rather roundabout argument to to say that uh, this is not an issue. Yeah, I, I I don't have a simple few line argument to to say that this is this is not a problem. Okay, so uh, 
So I just wanted to point out that this is related to some of the uh, 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 facts known in quantum information theory community. So there is a, a theorem called Eastern Kernel theorem, which said that uh, uh, if you want to, uh, enter, so if this is related to the uh, 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 quantum error correcting code. That suppose we want to encode information about the logical gate by product of Hilbert space for the, for the physical qubit, uh, well, logical qubit into physical qubit by some unitary. Then it is known that uh, it's called the Eastern Kinnor theorem that uh, 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 if there is a unit, uh, there, there is, uh, if the, 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 so, so if we have a unitary over here, uh, which is non-trivial and acting on the uh, logical qubit, you cannot express uh, it as a product of a unitary operator in physical qubit in such a way that it preserves the code subspace. Okay, so that's a sort of a statement. And it is closely related to the argument that Daniel and I gave. We learned about it after we uh, uh, wrote this proof. I have a few more comments. Uh, so, so are, this, uh, yes. There are a couple of que questions in the chat if you want to take them. Oh, okay, so let me open this. Uh, it'd be I'll nice be if uh, I cannot read chat while I speak. So, uh, uh, so the argument seems pretty simple. Why does the proof take so much space? Mm -hmm. Because the reason is that uh, uh, we have to define, we have to be, be careful in defining what we mean by symmetry. And uh, so as you can see, even, even in this talk that, that I took more uh, time explaining what symmetry are. Uh, and and uh, so, so in, in paper, it took more time. So the, from Jack, since we had counter example to splitability when the special topology non-trivial, topology fluctuation in quantum gravity, why gravitational theory splitable? Yeah, because uh, I, I'm assuming that the boundary is not fluctuating. So, so, so what is important is that conformal field theory on the boundary split. So I don't care whether the, so actually I, I don't, I, I'm not assuming anything about splitability or any, any of that sort of thing in the bulk. So, uh, so that's, uh, I, I, okay, good. So Jack said, okay, so uh, approved. Okay, so let me, with that approval, let me move on. So, so first thing I wanted to make, mention is that this argument works also for spontaneously broken global symmetry. And uh, so that was why I, I, I needed to relax some of the condition on global symmetry. So for example, uh, if you have a massless scalar field or scalar field which with, uh, with only derivative coupling, then there's a shift of symmetry. So, so th this happens, for example, in some of the inflation models, but this shift symmetry has to be bro eventually broken because uh, there is no such thing as the exact, exact spontaneously broken global symmetry. Uh, this argument also works for discrete space-time symmetry such as parity or time reversal. So that means that uh, at least in this context, it seems like uh, uh, parity and time reversal uh, must be gauge symmetry if they are exact, not global symmetry. So this would mean that, for example, as Jack said, that if you sum over topology, then it seems like in this kind of a theory, you have to sum over non-orientable manifolds as well as orientable manifolds. Okay. Uh, but this argument assumes holography. And in fact, uh, more than that, I it assume that holography with description in terms of uh, uh, Einstein gravity coupled to finite number of matters. And uh, uh, that's because that's what Ryu Takayanagi surface assumes. And so therefore it doesn't work for some of the lower dimensional examples such as two dimensional gravity. So we have example in 2D gravity with global symmetry. So for example, string Walsh series 2D gravity that you can have, for example, E8 cross E8 heterotic string theory, which has E8 cross E8 global symmetry. And uh, so these are like counter examples. Okay, so I'd like to also talk about the completeness of gauge representation. So now, now that we see that there is no such thing as global symmetry, so for the symmetry you can have in ADS a gauge symmetry. And uh, so if you have gauge symmetry uh, in the bulk, there is a global symmetry on the boundary. So suppose uh, 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 you have a, a G gauge symmetry, then you'd expect you have G global symmetry, but you may ask, well, are they the same group? So for example, uh, 
do so if you have a, a global symmetry in conformal field theory, does that act faithfully on bulk operator? Okay, so 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 here is a demonstration of this. So suppose you have a, a ADS black hole, and so there is a wormhole connecting them. Then in that case, uh, the, you, the, you can have a Hilbert space of uh, product, tensor product of Hilbert space of conformal field theory. And if you consider Wilson line connecting the going through the wormhole, then it acts on the both Hilbert spaces. And uh, uh, one can show that uh, uh, this uh, Wilson line with representation alpha, well, it acts as a representation alpha on, on one side of conformal field theory and on the other side of the conformal field theory. So if you consider, uh, uh, so, so then uh, you can show that for any element of the group, you can find the representation for which this does not commute with group action. So that means that uh, uh, you can faithfully represent uh, this symmetry on the boundary in terms of this Wilson line operator. So if the symmetry group is compact, then, then you have finite dimensional faithful uh, unitary representation in this case. And then uh, it is a relatively straightforward fact that you can show that if you take tensor product of any of such faithful representation, then it generates all finite dimensional irreducible representation of the, of the group G. So this, is, uh, this proves a completeness hypothesis. So, so basically, if you can show that the representation uh, uh, there is a faithful representation, then the completeness follows. Okay, so that's uh, that's sort of my comment on the completeness of the representation. So, uh, so in the remaining time, uh, I'm actually look like I'm going a little bit faster than I expected. So I would like to uh, clarify this completeness and uh, uh, a little bit more. So here it says that the certain represent uh, all, all of all, any representation appears, but it doesn't tell you how they appear, what kind of uh, density that uh, each of these representations have. So, so actually, uh, in my recent paper with Daniel a few months ago, uh, we, gave, uh, 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 we, we gave a definite statement in the asymptotic decomposition of uh, 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 conformal field theory state into representations. And more recently, uh, I'm doing some work with my student and the postdoc generalized. So this, this work was for finite group, but we are generalizing it for continuous group. So I'd like to mention this if I have time. So, so here is uh, uh, what Daniel and I showed in this recent paper. So suppose you have a conformal field theory and suppose it has a holographic dual. And suppose uh, this conformal field theory have finite group global symmetry. So, so then you can consider this, uh, uh, what mathematicians call twine passion function. That is that uh, rather than just considering passion function, you insert some unitary operator uh, for group element G. Okay. And uh, what Daniel and I showed that was that if you, this conformal field theory has holographic dual in terms of Einstein gravity, then for large temperature, when beta small T is large, then this group dependence is basically delta function. So in this case, since this is finite group, this means that uh, uh, G has to be identity, otherwise this vanishes to the leading order, okay? So, so if you have finite group, of course, this delta function can be written as sum of a representation of the group multiplied by character with this way. So that means that if you pick a random state in high energy, then the probability that such a state being in the representation alpha is given by square of the, proportional to the square of the dimension of uh, the uh, representation. And uh, since uh, dimension of representation has this normalizability property, so therefore the denominator is normalized to be the uh, size of the group, the number of elements of the group, okay? So this is a statement. So let me uh, give, you, give you a derivation of this statement in the context of holographic conformal field theory. So, so we want to show this for, for high temperature. So if you, your temperature is sufficiently high, higher than Hawking page transition, then you would expect the bulk to be dominated by the black hole configuration. So now you are inserting in the group element, so I'm inserting G in here. So I want to show that this vanishes unless G is one. Okay, so here's an argument. 
Let's insert Wilson line operator in representation alpha with the representation index i and index j. When these indices are close to each endpoint are close to each other, they are proportional to Kronecker delta in the space of representation, identity in the space of representation. But we are considering finite group, then there is no local holonomy. So the local coverage, there is no local coverage. So we can move the endpoint to the other side and then cross this unitary operator. So that gives you a representation matrix. And then go back to this configuration where again, if K and J are close to each other, it becomes identity. So that means that you have this product. Basically you have this identity for high temperature. Okay, so, so we may ask what is the solution to this equation? And this, this is supposed to hold for any rep unitary representation alpha. So this is related to the, the kind of property I used earlier by Peter Weyer theorem. So we can repeat this exercise again and say that uh, this is true only if and only if G is trivial. So therefore it is false. Okay. So this is a rather simple derivation of uh, uh, rather uh, interest of what we may consider interesting fact. But we didn't use very much about bulk theory. So for, so for example, it doesn't have to be precisely ADH first sheet black hole. The only thing I, we used is that this boundary cycle, cycle is contractible. So this seems to be, this doesn't seem to be depending on the very detailed dynamical information, ex except for the holographic dual where summer cycle contract in high temperature. So this may hold for a large class of quantum field theory. So that was conjecture we made in our paper. And in fact, uh, there have been some uh, following work. Uh, actually, actually, this work pre preceded what we did, uh, pre predated what we did. We learned it after the fact. That, uh, uh, so uh, Sudip Power and Soon showed a uh, year before that uh, this property hold for any unitary conformal field theory in two dimension. And in two dimension, you can use uh, modular invariance to show this. So the idea is the following. So suppose you in, in two dimensional partition function, you consider this kind of partition function. So you twist in the time, you twist by G in the time direction. But if you do modular transformation, then you are calculating this in the sector that is twisted in G in the spatial direction. And all you need to show is that uh, the ground state energy of this twisted sector for non-trivial G is greater than that of the, the vacuum of the original theory. And if so, then uh, if you go back to the uh, original by doing the modular transformation back to the original setup, that means that if G is non-trivial, then for high temperature, that contribution is suppressed by the exponent exponential of the uh, temperature. And uh, so that, therefore this follows. Uh, you can also uh, do uh, uh, twist this argument a little bit to show that uh, this also for, for, the, for uh, continuous U1 symmetry. And so that's what uh, uh, these people did. Uh, so there, there are also some uh, very interesting looking work by uh, 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 Javier Megan uh, sh uh, 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 showing this property uh, for finite group uh, using certain property of some field double state. I, I cannot claim I have totally understood the, the, the derivation. So, so I, I please excuse me that I not able to uh, comment on this well. Suridip uh, Par and uh, 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 Kao and Tom Beria, these two people are actually at IPMU. Uh, they also uh, showed this statement for weakly coupled quantum field theory. So basically they showed this for free theory and argued that uh, 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 the turning on weak interaction would not modify this type of behavior. And their proof is rather interesting. So, so they, they, they even for free field, it's rather non-trivial uh, exercise uh, in organizing representation in the Hilbert space of free field and show that this something like that happens. And recently, uh, 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 Jai Hari, uh, my student, and Monica Khan and I uh, generalized some of these arguments uh, for a compact D group situation too. So, so in that case, uh, uh, you have essentially this type of behavior, but uh, for high temperature. As soon as this talk is over. Yeah.
Uh, so essentially that's all I wanted to say. So I have uh, some more time, some time to for discussion. Uh, so so I I would like to leave with some question for the future. So so this uh, the absence of global symmetries means that if you have a low energy effective theory of quantum gravity, and uh, uh, if you have a global symmetry in low energy, so sometimes it happens. For example, standard model of particle physics has B minus L symmetry, which is exact in the context of a standard model, but we expect it to be broken. So then uh, if it is broken, how it is broken? And if it is gauged, how is it gauged? And uh, so interesting question is that uh, are they suppressed by Planck, uh, in power of Planck mass or are they exponential suppressions? So, so we don't know, but it would be interesting to uh, refine this uh, 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 result to quantify, uh, quantify the way that it is broken. And uh, it would be interesting to find an upper bound on the mass of charged particle required by this completeness hypothesis. This was sort of, this was sort of motivated. This work was sort of motivated by this, trying to understand how the high temperature state decomposes into representation. But for example, you can ask what is the first instance where a charged particle appears. So this is related to weak gravity conjecture too. So, so, so this is something we would like to understand. And of course, we would like to go beyond ads -CFT correspondence too. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, it looks like I'm ending early, but uh, that would leave plenty of time for discussion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So yes, we have plenty of time for questions. So Andrew has hands up and uh, uh, two Andrew, both Andrews. <laughs> Okay, one of you go ahead. Well, I was actually just applauding, but but. Uh, um, uh, excuse me. Maybe somebody else has some microphone on. You don't have to turn off, uh, Andy. Uh, Andy. I have a small comment. It's not a. It doesn't cause any problem for anything you said, but it's a little bit peculiar. In bulk, the gauge group isn't really uniquely defined because there are dualities. For example, if the bulk is four-dimensional, SO two n plus one could be equivalent to SP n or two n, depending on your notation. You and mean in the bulk? In the bulk? Yes, in a four-dimensional bulk. Ah, oh, okay. One could be equivalent to another, and there are more complicated examples of this for a three-dimensional bulk. So the bulk gauge symmetry isn't actually uniquely determined. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> and. I believe it's therefore true that the same ball can go with different boundaries that have different gauge symmetries. Sorry, different global symmetries. Or let me say it better. That's true in condensed matter physics uh, for topologically non-trivial systems. I don't know if it's really true in holography, but you so, can imagine- So do you, do you think that can happen in this context? Because I, I thought that the global symmetry in this context is something that is physically defined. It could happen in some other instances, well, but uh, clearly, in this case- I, I think it clearly can happen in the following sense. Oh yeah, I, I believe the answer is yes. That just looking at the bulk theory, you wouldn't be able to determine always what the gauge symmetry is. What Even you for this uh, no, uh, non-normalizable part of the gauge symmetry at infinity, you say that? No, that's well-defined. That's well-defined. That's, well, that's well-defined, but it depends on the particular asymptotic boundary you consider. So I'm not sure- Oh, I see. So you say that the different, different choice of gauge symmetry, you can have a different way to impose boundary condition resulting in different global symmetry on the boundary. Well, I don't know how to give holographic examples, but I think it's conceivable that there are. Ah, I see. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. But do you think that's coming from the different way of imposing boundary condition for the same what? bulk theory? Well, that would be a semi-classical version of it. I'm not sure it's guaranteed to be understandable semi-classically. I see. But maybe. Okay. Oh, that's, in, that's very interesting. 
So, so there are, you say that there are such examples known in the topological mm -hmm. phases. Of well, well the, be uh, the best known example is that in four dimensions, uh, the group G is equivalent to its Langone's dual group for n equals four. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all those are different groups. But, uh, in three dimensions, there are lots of examples for topological states of matter. Uh, well, for turn times theories. E8 at level one is equivalent to ah, I see. U1 to the eight and so on. There are all kinds of examples and they're more complicated ones. In three dimensions, there are lots of examples with Trent Simons theories, but there also are, of course, examples in four dimensions. In four dimensions, it doesn't happen if you have an infrared free theory. So um, usually when we do holography, we assume our bulk theory is infrared free. Mm -hmm. Then it has a well-defined gauge group, at least in four dimensions. I see. Four dimensional bulk. I'm not sure about three-dimensional bulk. I, I don't think that's true. But so for the case of a four-dimensional bulk, I'm asking you about what we don't usually study, but there's no reason not to. Or I maybe see. I'm wrong. We don't usually discuss it. It might be, I'm a little bothered about it. Take the ADS5 times S5. I, I'm forgetful right now, but it's four-dimensional and it has a, it's not completely obvious why the bulk theory is infrared free because it has a, a gauge theory, non equivalent gauge group, the, S, the R symmetry group, non equivalent gauge group in four dimensions. Uh, maybe it's infrared free, but I'm forgetting why. Uh, okay, I'm missing something at the moment. So, so for, for your work to work, uh, for your argument to work, does do, do both, do, both sides of duality has to be infrared free? Well, I don't know quite what happens in ADS space. In asymptotically flat space in four dimensions, the gauge group is well-defined in an infrared free theory, but mm. not an infrared non-free theory, such as n equals four super angles. Okay. But you see, going back to your lecture, the reason I'm not saying anything that contradicts your lecture, the global symmetry of the boundary is well-defined. And I believe whatever it is, it has to be possible to interpret the bulk as having that gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't exclude the hypothesis that the bulk could be interpreted with a different gauge symmetry, ah, yes. which would go more naturally with a different boundary. Ah, okay. I don't know if that can happen or not. I'm just, in part, I'm just asking the question. Okay, thank you. I, I need to think whether there are good, interesting example of that type. Thank you for suggesting this. Sure. Well, I, I, I think you'll have trouble giving an example with no, giving a known based on known things. At least in four, at least for four dimensional bulk. Mm. Okay, uh, Andy has a question. Well, I, I think I've asked you this question before, but maybe I'll. Uh, just check whether anything's changed. Uh, uh, do you know whether any of these ideas um, might have an extension to higher form global symmetries? Yeah, I think that's 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 very very plausible. Uh, I have not had time to think about it, but uh, 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 yeah. So I, I think we need to understand some of these properties like splitability, etc., in this context. But uh, uh, but if it seems like uh, uh, assuming some some uh, natural generalization of this notion, then these prop these arguments may go through. Thank you. So the other Andrew was raising hand, if I remember it correctly, or not? No. Okay. So <laughs> sorry, that was not uh, raising hand. Oh, okay, so Nati has hands raised. Yeah, so you mentioned that this is not true in two dimensions. Yes, what, I did. What's the deep reason for that? Well, I know why you can't run your arg you might not be able to run your argument in two dimensions, but what's the deep reason that two dimensions is special? Why two dimensions is special? Because I think this argument, well, 
one, one thing to special two dimensions being special is that uh, there is no spatial extension of the holographic dual. Uh, the holographic dual, if it exists, well, first of all, some of the quantum gravity theory may not have a holographic dual, but if it has, it, it, it does not have a spatial extension. So, so that might be a reason, but you can ask, well, be, uh, forgetting about holography, is there a reason? Is that a quick right. question? Yeah, that, that was the question. You cannot run your argument. I understand why. Right, you yeah. I, 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 I think that uh, somehow the absence of global symmetry and the existence of black holes are closely tied to each other. So in theory, without uh, black hole, it seems like this argument has little chance of being, I mean, the, 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 I, I suspect that it has to do with the fact that black hole does not exist. Imagine you take a theory in high dimensions and you, and you compactify it. Mm -hmm. Is there a range of size of the compactification such that you could say something? Right. Are there, are there an example of two-dimensional gravity with black holes where you can have global symmetry? Don't ask me. <laughs> there, there, are, there are example of 2D gravity with black holes, right? I thought that the standard witness black hole is not really a black hole if the theory is purely two dimensional. Mm -hmm. Perhaps even you, maybe it was in one of your papers. Yeah, so, so, you, so you're saying that suppose you, you consider high dimensional black hole and compact by two dimension, you're asking why, when does it fail? Yeah, so it should fail at some point. You should be able, because when the radius is very big, it is essentially you're in the big space. And when the radius is very small, you cannot run the argument. So there must be something in between. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought about it that way. I see. Okay, yeah, I don't have an immediate answer to that question. I also have a, another question about Witten's earlier comment. You cannot have two dual descriptions that both of them are weakly coupled. So right. either one of them is strongly coupled and the other is weakly coupled and then there's no paradox. So the question only arises when both of them are strongly coupled. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if the bulk has a gauge symmetry and it is strongly coupled, is it even meaningful to discuss the global symmetry of the boundary theory? I thought you were going to ask if they're still the same, rather than if it's meaningful to discuss the global symmetry of the boundary theory, because global symmetries of ordinary quantum field theories can be defined abstractly. So, even for strong, yes. it makes sense. I thought. Yeah. So I, I thought that the only way. So there are two ways to get out of this question. One is that there are two ways to formulate the boundary. This is one thing you said, and the no. other is that there is no global symmetry at all. No, not two ways to formulate the boundary. I suggested two different boundaries. In a semi-classical version, you would think of it as coming with different boundary conditions, but that might be oversimplified, especially because the gauge symmetries are possibly strongly coupled, as you say. But the idea was not that there's one boundary theory with um, two different. Uh, right, that, that cannot happen so, because global symmetry- Well, at least one case we know. If, if we're looking in three dimensions and they say a chern simons theory and they're different chern simons theory, we can have different yeah. boundary conditions for that. And then it's easy. And that's what you said with, the, with different boundary conditions when it's semi-classical. I guess, but imagine you have several dual theories, all of them are strongly coupled. Is it clear at all that there the, is a meaningful global symmetry at the boundary? Uh, well, it, it's Hiroshi's seminar, so Hiroshi should- <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to, to, to hear what you said. Uh, I would say yes, uh, quantum, global symmetry is defined in any quantum field theory. But it might be that there isn't one. 
there, there are field theories which don't have a global symmetry. So if you have two strongly coupled gauge groups, yes, right. which are dual to each other, G1 and G2, yes. and it might be that the boundary theory does not have any global symmetry. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I see. If you don't have a semi-classical picture of the bulk yeah. theory, that's, yeah. if you don't, it's hard to explain abstractly in what, I think the direction in which this is clear is the direction that actually appeared in Hiroshi's lecture. That was why I said I wasn't objecting to anything. If there is a, bound, a global symmetry of the boundary, then the bulk has to have a corresponding gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say. I may make a statement in the other direction. Right. But it's still an interesting question. I agree. Are there other questions? Oh, I, I have a. Oh, hi, man. Hi, hi. 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 My, my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so yes, I, I have a very simple question about this uh, the, the non split example you mentioned, the Maxwell theory. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yeah. I, know, I know people in, uh, in algebra quantum field theory actually have a hard time defining those. Algebras, you know the, you know what you write as as a sigma or you know something like that, you know the local algebras, because the Maxwell theory, because you know the, this 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 lines, the Wilson lines, and so forth, they're not really local operators; they're string-like localized things. So I think I think there there's some difficulty in even defining uh, the local algebras in that context. Oh, is that so? So, so suppose, for example, you consider regions, and you consider Wilson line entirely in that region. Is, is yes. there some question of whether you can consider that as, as an element of A of that region? Yes, yes, that's what I thought. You know, because oh, okay. these are string-like objects. So, the ones I'm familiar with, you know, you, you define local algebras. You know, define on some, some, for instance, some. Um, some diamond, you know, things like that. Here, uh, it looks like the examples uh, you, I mean, this is the first time I saw such example, maybe it's just because I haven't checked the literature carefully, but uh, is this example written somewhere or is it just something you Well, we, we mentioned that in your paper, but uh, yeah, I don't know who, what, what the original reference should be. I see. And certainly I, I have not seen it in the context of actual, uh, Algebraic quantum field theory in literature. I see. Yeah, because my understanding is that there's some difficulty even defining that theory in the in the standard uh, local uh, algebraic quantum field theory framework. I see. So if that's the case, then you know um, I'm not sure one can formulate this as a precise statement. But anyway, that's that's just one comment. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the comment. But I think that. Uh, uh, this argument probably works for any theory with one form global symmetry. So yeah, maybe there, there are some more. Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually what I like to understand. You know, understand. Uh, I know there, I have actually heard quite a few higher form symmetry talks, but uh, I have, you know, I, I have to admit- You are not, you are not sure any of that makes sense in algebraic quantum field theory? That's, that's a question. Yes, that's a question I have. Him. I mean, I you know, it's it's not clear to me how to actually even define that in a proper way. I see. So you you, anyway, you said you are not you are not aware of any example with higher form symmetry which makes sense as a, in the context of algebraic context. Yes, yes, that's true because the, you have to define you know this this algebra of local observables. Uh, oftentimes, I see them as a black box, but what's actually in that black box? is the question, you know, if you have this higher form of symmetry, how, how do you actually even define those things in the first place? You know, you start with Hilbert space, we start with operators on the Hilbert space. How do you define those symmetries um, in, in that context? It's already, I think I it's already a question. Well, I, I, see Shou, Shou, I see Shuhan is turning on his video, so maybe he has something to say about it. No, I only have a question. Hi, Hiroshi. <laughs> hey. yeah, may, uh, may I just ask, say something about the previous comment? 
Please. Oh, I, I do have a question about the previous comment. <laughs> ah, okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in three dimensions, you can consider a free compact scalar. Massless, free scalar, everything is quadratic. That theory has a one-point symmetry. So I was wondering, is it from the local algebraic quantum field theory point of view, is a free compact scalar not well-defined? Uh, let's see. And, and before you do that, I have a more elementary example. Maxwell theory, just the pure Maxwell theory in two dimensions, F squares, that also has a one-form symmetry. Um, it's effectively quantum mechanics if you put it on a circle, but this theory makes sense. So that it's U1 in two dimensions, U1 gauge theory in two dimensions. Lower dimension case, I, you know, I, no, I haven't thought about this carefully, but. Well, I'm happy to go up in dimensions. Maxwell theory in four dimensions also has a one form symmetry. In fact, yes, it but, oh, this is, this is the kind of example, yes, I, I'm talking about. I went down in dimensions to, to have the example, to make the example as simple as possible. <laughs> that, that's, that's something I have to think about because I, I have to admit that, you know, uh, from the work, you know, my impression that is, you, you know, for mathematicians, this is this well-known difficulty of constructing even non-trivial examples in quantum control theory in the, in the right dimension, right? The only exceptional case are the conformal field theories in two dimensions where, you know, there's, there's well-developed mathematical theory. In all the other cases, um, there are all kinds of issues. Um, um, so, so, yeah, so <laughs> that that's why, you know, it, it takes, I, I don't know. I mean, I, to, to answer your question, Nadi, I, I, I don't really know. Uh, I guess I guess the vocabulary also doesn't help because uh, I don't exactly the definition of what's, uh, what's well from symmetry. So my, my I mean, as a, as a mathematician, um, you know, when you define symmetry, usually we have a Hilbert space. We have operators acting on Hilbert space. If you give me an observer algebra, I want to know what that algebra is. What's, what's the operators generating that algebra in the first place? Okay. So, so in that sense, I actually don't know the answer to your question. Yeah, so I, I couldn't hear what you said, but it, the example of Maxwell theory in two dimensions is completely solvable. We can write everything down very explicitly. The operator that generates the symmetry is E, the electric field at the point. And you can compute all correlation functions. Everything is calculable. Well, can I can I ask you a question? Then, I mean, in your example, if you consider uh, what uh, Hiroshi write down as local algebras, are these local algebras type one factors? Oh, this is way above my pay grade. But <laughs> oh, local okay. algebra is completely trivial. I see. I see. Okay. Then, then, uh, well, if that's the case, I, then I think you, that example can be worked out completely. Just yeah, I don't it's know. I, don't know solvable. Exactly. I believe actually F Maxwell theory in any number of dimensions is a solvable theory and it should be completely rigorously defined. Is, is it a quantum field theory? Sorry? Is it a quantum field theory or just classical physics? Quantum, quantum field theory. That's interesting because my understanding is that uh, the algebras of local circles are all type three factors. <laughs> so, so we were apparently talking about different things, but anyway, I'd like to learn more from you on this. But Shulfen's example may be quantum field theory in your sense, right? Well, it's also it's also in gauge theory. All of them are the same example because Shulfen's yeah, example that is a... dual to a U1 gauge ah, theory. Okay. In oh, I see, I see, I see. I, I presented as a free scalar theory because I I thought that that would make it easier. Oh, free scalar theory. There's no no problem. Yes, that's a free theory. So well, any intimation is well is well known. Yes, well, but. That's... But in three dimensions, uh, yeah, it's a. I'm considering a free massless scalar theory. But one thing that's one additional property I have to say is that the scalar field is compact. The target space is a circle rather than a real line. So that theory with a compact target space has a one point symmetry. So I was wondering if that makes sense as a local uh, algebraic quantum field theory. 
Well, I can tell you right away that, that uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that. I actually don't know anybody that thought about that. Um, yeah. So so yes, yeah, so if you if you mean in the in the very in the in the in the precise way that's defined, I, I I'm actually not sure about that. Okay. Oh, is is the fact that target space being compact making it problematic for you? Well, not for me, but uh, okay, yeah, I guess the question. Oh, for, 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 <laughs> right. For fan. That's actually a good question. I, I have to think about it. I have to 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 to, uh, to get more information from you guys on this. So it's a it's a three dimensional um, tree theory, except uh, the scalar has been computed. But why, why do you stay on three dimensions? Why why can you go down to two dimensions? In that case, that's a continuum scalar. That's something I know very well. So, sorry, your audio is not very clear. <laughs> Couldn't quite hear you. Oh, really? No, it's better. <laughs> okay, sorry. I should get closer to the screen. So, but but why why are you stay in three dimensions? Why can you go down to two dimension? Would that would that be a problem? It's not a problem. It's just that the two dimensional compact free scalar theory has only zero form symmetry. Has only ordinary global symmetry. I see. But I see. since the conversation started with higher form symmetries, I brought up the example of it. I see, okay, all right. Risk. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So are there any more questions for Hiroshi? Then maybe we should thank him again. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for a very interesting Questions and discussions. I really enjoyed. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi. Thanks for the talk. See you all in two weeks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hiroshi. <laughs>